Be in the house of the Lord one more time. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise. Now, as I'm sure everybody knows, we know where our pastor is. I am his faithful stand-in today. And so we're going to do our absolute best to praise the Lord, to honor God, to not embarrass our pastor and our denomination. Amen. Amen. As we start our worship experience. So for those of you that are able to stand, we ask that you do. And let's go with our choir. Amen. Let's enjoy the ball.
Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek thy good. Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. Lord, I have loved thy habitation, the place where thy honor dwelleth. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Together, O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the earth sing praises. Our hymn of the day is hymn number 62.
were kind enough, gracious enough, merciful enough to touch us with the finger of love and awaken us and stir us from our slumber and our sleep. We say thank you for that, Lord, because many went to sleep last night and did not wake up on this side this morning. And so we thank you again for a portion of our health and our, our strength. As our ancestors used to say, we thank you for our rains. We thank you for the food on our table. We thank you for being in a good portion of our health and strength. We thank you, Lord, for clothing us in our right mind. That our bed was not our cooling table. That you gave us cars to drive. A little change in our pocket, even though our change may be a little strange and our money sometimes is funny, but we still have some where others have none. And so we say thank you. We thank you, Lord, for the uh, members of our congregation, our pastor and others, and all throughout our annual conference that are at our 52nd quadrant as they seek to do your work, do the business of the church. Help those that are away to be mindful of what their purpose is and to put away petty human agendas and latch on to God's agenda so that we can make it another 200 plus years to try to be the light in this world. Lord, we ask that you bless our choir, bless all of the congregants, bless those who have joined us online. And then, of course, Lord, we ask for the forgiveness of our sins, our sins of omission, our sins of commission, that these and all of our prayers be heard. Let us praise you in spirit and truth this morning. Let us be on fire for you this morning as we praise your holy name. This is our prayer and collectively all God's people said, Amen, Amen, Amen. Amen.
on this side long enough, you're going to leave this side. And you're going to go to another side. And the side you want to go to is the side we just got through saying about. Amen? Amen. It's time to read scripture. We're going to ask that you turn to page number 576 in your Red Pew Bible on the back of your pew. And those who are able to stand, we're going to ask you to stand as we read this, this passage of Scripture responsibly. I will do my best to get us through it expeditiously. It's a long piece, but we have to read it all in order to get our context for the message that is to come. Amen? amen. Y'all with me? Can I get an amen for the reading? All right. All right. Uh, I'm going to do like Mateo. I still get pages. <laughs> so we're going to wait just a little bit. All right. Just a little bit. Is that all right? Yeah. Page 576 at the bottom of the page in the right hand column. The heading is Naama is healed of leprosy. Starting at verse number one says, Now Naama was a commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded. Because through him the Lord had given victory to Aaron. He was a valiant soldier, but he had lepers. Now the man of Aaron had gone out, and they came back with a young girl from Israel, and she served the young wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who was in Samaria, he would cure him of his lepers. By all means, go, the king of Aaron replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naomi left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me?
that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Glory be. <laughs>
Deborah Seiler. Uh, Pastor asked me via Curtis, who couldn't be here today, to talk about a personal volunteer story. And I don't know about you, but um, Tuesday night when I saw Michelle Obama address the convention, I cried because she talked about her mother. And it reminded me of my Aunt Bernice. Uh, I, my mother died shortly after, a few days after I turned four years old. And my Aunt Bernice every morning, every single morning would walk down and she would get breakfast for these three little half orphans. And then she would go off and the only time she didn't come was on election day. And on election day, she hosted the polling place at her house back in the old days when they counted votes until midnight at night. She also, she was a wonderful seamstress, and she would help some of the elder gentlemen in the neighborhood who couldn't afford to buy new shirts. And the collars would wear out. And she would spend hours turning the collars on those shirts and charge those nice gentlemen 25 cents just to preserve their dignity. She would later then start to deliver home-cooked hot meals every single night as a volunteer to community members who were shut-ins. And she was ultimately recognized by the city for this, but she did it for years and years and years. She would go, she'd work at the grocery store, and she would come home and cook dinner and take it to those, to those elderly ladies. And then on the weekend, she would clean their house, change the sheets on their bed, all for, for free. This was, this was just what came out of her heart. And to me, she embodied the spirit of volunteerism and serving the community. She also volunteered at the hospital, at the local hospital. And she would go down, she would walk down to the church, pick up the linens, bring the linens home, and wash the linens for the church. I mean, there was really nothing that my Aunt Bernice didn't do for the community. And this is a time, I think our Social Action Committee Commission is really looking for volunteer efforts um, to help our community in various ways. Voting certainly is uppermost in our minds right now, but there are so many other ways we can help our community. So thank you very much.
child in Oklahoma, as you grew up coming right out of Jim Crow. And even to this day, there are some downtowns in the state of Oklahoma. Right. Stop and think about that. And so while the church cannot tell you who to vote for and what to vote for, but it can certainly encourage you to vote. You have to vote like your grandbaby's life depend on you. You have to vote as your great great grandbaby you might not even be here to see these lives depend on you. We are at a perilous crossroads in this country. There's a whole group of folk that if they could, they put us back in chains and back on the plantation. They've already shown through law enforcement where they want to whip and beat on us and try to get away with it. So you need to vote. Talk to the young people in your family and tell them how important it is for them to vote. Michelle Obama said it best, do something. And that something is to vote. Amen? church financially. You know, during the summer months, uh, some people go on vacation, some people uh, like to kind of maybe stay home on a Sunday, but, you know, our church financial obligations continue, amen? We have to keep the lights on, the air, right? When it was 100 degrees, we have to keep the air running. So I just want to thank all of you that continue to support the church financially during the spring and summer months, whether you were here, sitting, in the congregation or whether you were away, because I know there are various methods to pay, right? You can pay in your envelope and I'll be there to collect those, or you can pay uh, through Giveify, you can text your payment. And as the pastor, um, I'm giving you a point there, as our minister, <laughs> as our minister Caden uh, mentioned, for those of you, we we're saying welcome to you that are online, but if you want to support St. Andrews financially, uh, I think up on the screen, there are ways that you can contribute. So again, thank you for your contribution uh, to our church and to our church family and for the growth of this church and uh, for allowing us to do God's business. Amen? Let's bow our head for a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for your goodness, Lord, your mercy, your grace that you give to all of us, Lord Jesus. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity, for the means to give, Lord. And Lord, we don't want to take it for granted, but we appreciate all that you do, Lord. So Lord, touch our hearts and, and let us know what you have us to give, Lord. We thank you, we glorify you, and we give you all the honor and praise. It's in your name. Just as, for, uh, as a reminder, the mask is for the general offering and the pouch is for the missionary offering. Please stand and follow the directions of the usher. Thank you. There you go.
given to us to give back to you. We give thee but our thine all.
he was a husband. And he was a man of means, as we'll learn later as we walk through the text. But we have to understand that even with all of that, Naaman had a problem. Because when we read verse number one, out of the NRS, we reads this way. It says, Naaman, commanded the army of the king of Aaron, was a great man and in high favor with his master. Because of him, the Lord had given victory to Aaron. The man, though a mighty warrior, suffered from lepers. The New King James reads it this way. It says, Now the army, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master. Because by him, the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but a leper. The King James reads it this way. It says, Now I'm the captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. The title of today's message is, Sometimes It Just Don't Make Sense. Sometimes It Just Don't Make Sense. And so as we, as we look at this narrative, we are faced with our first moment in the text. Because in verse 1, it provides a synopsis of, of who and what Naaman was. It tells us that, that he was the captain of, of the host of the army of the king of Syria. Captain of the host simply means that he was a general. He was highly decorated. He was a man who would fight a multiplicity of battles and won some major battles for Syria. And as a result of that, he gained fame. He gained notoriety. He gained a measure of fortune. But with all of that going on, and he had a wife. And he had a wife. But with all of that going on for himself, he was a leper. Sometimes it just don't make sense, right? In spite of all that Naomi's life was, it was framed by the conjunction, but. Right? And many of us have taught that when we see, when we are reading, and we see the word but, it is reflexively a cause for pause. Because you know something else is coming after the but. Right? And it's usually, but what? Right? And so in the context of this narrative, we find out the name is but, B-U-T, was a skin condition. However, that skin condition over the years has been called leprosy. Though there is a debate, a scriptural debate, as to whether or not Naaman actually had leprosy. Nonetheless, Naaman's but, his B-U-T, was significant. With all that he had going for himself, he had the favor of the king, he had distinguished himself on the battlefield, he had a wife, he was a man of means, and in verse 5 it gives an account of Naaman's preparation for travel. And in particular, what caught my attention was the amount of money that he took on the trip. So I took some time to do a little research, and I found out that those, all of those shekels and all of those talents was worth more than over, over $540,000 in today's money. Right. And he had... 10 changes as follows. So he was suited and booted. His money wasn't funny. And his change wasn't strange. Amen? But with all of that, but Naaman was a leper. How do you make sense of a life of accomplishment? a life of achievement. You have notoriety, you have money, you have favor at the highest levels of government, yet you are afflicted 
with a condition that makes you both a picture of pity, but also in need of prayer. Sometimes it just don't make sense. See, Naomi's condition caused him to be, to be viewed as undesirable, something less than someone who was, as I said, worthy of both praise because of his military exploits, but of pity because of his condition, right? Beloved, we all know someone like that. As a matter of fact, we look at that person every day, at least once a day, when we look in the mirror. Right. Oh yes, we are both worthy of pity and of praise. The pity because of the frailty of our human condition, the thoughts that we think, the words that we say, especially when we're on the freeway and somebody cuts us off. The things that we lose patience with, the people that we lose patience with, the circumstances that we lose patience with. And the way that we respond makes us worthy of pity. But the other side of that is that we were all created in God's image. And because we were created in God's image, we also are worthy of a modicum of praise. Because God didn't make no junk. I'm not junk, you're not junk, even with our B-U-T apostrophes, right? We are still worthy of praising God and God's praise because he made us in his image, right? See, elsewhere in the Word, I believe you'll find it in, 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 in the collection of Psalms, right? He stated that we are his handiwork and we are made in his image, which means we are made in the image of perfection. We are also worthy of pity, right, because, once I get this page separated, we are foolish, we are sinful, we are thoughtless, because we are human beings. We, my brothers and my sisters, are walking, we are a walking dichotomy. There are two sides to this coin. One is a head side, and one is a tail side. The B-U-T-T side of things, right? See, this narrative is very interesting because it includes multiple personalities. There are multiple players in this. For example, the captive slave girl. Naomi's wife, who is silent. Naomi's king speaks up by way of the letter and gives Naomi uh, leave to go, right? You also have the king of Israel, and then of course you have a preacher prophet. These are all the players that are part of this narrative, and all of them play a critical role in the healing of Naomi. But see, here's the second aha moment that occurs, and it occurs when the captive girl, the little slave girl, who was captured during the Assyrian army's conquest, and who is now assigned to be Naomi's wife's servant. She is her handmaid. But she hears about Naomi's condition, and she says to her mistress, if the master were only with the prophet, his condition would be healed. Now, I know I paraphrased that because time is of the essence, and I don't want to lose you, amen? amen. But, but notice, notice, notice that her statement starts with another conjunction. So we have a but and an if, right? Which means that there are conditions that have to be met or are yet to be met or have already been met Right? If this happens, that happens. If that doesn't happen, then this doesn't happen. But if that happens, right? So when we see the word if, we know that there's a condition or conditions that are offered to better describe or define thought. In this instance, the captain is now Naomi's wife's servant who introduces the idea that it made this new prophet, right, uh, the preacher, is visited 
that he can cure Naaman's leprosy. Right? So that means that the preacher, the preacher is a participant in this narrative and is a key player. But understand that all of this happens around a misunderstanding. Because Naaman says to his king, King, there's this guy. Right? I heard of somebody who has the ability to change my condition, to fix my situation. And because Naaman had favor with his boss, his boss said, you know what? I'm going to let you go. Go ahead, and I will send you with a letter. So the boss has, in effect, granted authority, and under his authority, in the form of a letter, sent Naaman to visit another monarch. See, kings generally talk to kings. They talk to their generals when they're at war. But they usually talk to each other directly or they'll send an emissary who has a letter that is stamped with a signet, a wax seal, that says that this is official. You see it's official by my image or whatever that signet is, right? And you need to pay attention to what's written herein. So they are the goals equipped. The king of Israel receives the honor. And he receives the letter and immediately goes into distress after reading the letter. Why? Because in the letter there was contained a misunderstanding. The misunderstanding was because of the letter it states, I'm sending, basically I'm sending my guy to you because you can heal him. King of Israel is like, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> That's above my pay grade. <laughs> and you try to pick a fight with me. <laughs> See, you think you slick. And you sent your top general to deliver the message. Fights are started over things much simpler than even that. Right? Yet, 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 we see that that the preacher, some kind of way, hears about this exchange between the two kings. Now, in the text, it doesn't tell us how the preacher heard about it. Sometimes, it just don't make sense. How did the preacher hear about it? It doesn't tell us. So we're left to assume, we're left to guess about what happened. Suffice to say, I think that we can agree that if the preacher is really called of God, the God that we serve will make sure that the preacher knows all that he or she needs to know, whether you tell them or not. God will put messengers in place, right, that are ear hustling on behalf of the preacher. And they'll run back. And tell the preacher the stuff they ain't supposed to tell, as well as the things that the preacher needs to hear. How many times has the pastor preacher reached out to you and said, Sister or Brother So and so, I heard such and such and such thing? You didn't tell them. You might not have even told anybody else. But some kind of way, the spy network of the preacher goes to work and delivers the message, right? So the preacher is a, is, is a, is a key player in, in the narrative, right? And, and who do we call oftentimes when we get in trouble? Who do we call, who do we call when, when Ray Ray and Pookie and Naquan and 
Shaquan and Mimi and Lele and them, and them are in trouble. Who do we call? Oftentimes we call the preacher. If our marriage is rocking, our church relationships are, uh, are shaky, who do we call? Who do we reach out to? We reach out to the preacher, right? And so this, this, this whole idea of the preacher playing a significant role in the lives of all that God places in their path is significant. Remember, Naomi is not of the house of Israel. He's a Syrian, right? He's a Syrian. This idea of being healed by the holy man grabs Naomi's attention. And as I said earlier, he tells his boss, hey man, I need to go see this cat, right? King sends, sends him with a, with, with a letter. Misunderstanding ensues, right? Yet, the preacher steps in to the gap. Bridges the misunderstanding, and the story continues on, right? And see, when we get to, when we get to, when we get to verse 9, we begin to see some things take shape in the narrative, right? And they're captured in the response of the preacher, they're captured in the response of the king, and they're captured in the response of Naomi. So, the word is said to Naomi, say, hey, go see the preacher. Now I was like, all right, I'll go see the preacher. But the way that Naomi rolled up, he didn't walk. He didn't stroll. He didn't drag his leg. He rolled up with his full contention. His horses, his chariots, all the people that work for him, his MC Ham entourage. Right? I remember what happened. He had like 50 people with him, wherever he showed up. If he was on the sideline, it was 50 people. If he was on stage, it was 100 people. If he was flying, it might have been 200 people. He showed up with an entourage. So did Naomi. Right? And the preacher doesn't even come out when he rolls up. The preacher says an emissary. Now, when you are great and mighty, or you think you are, you expect special treatment. You expect the red carpet to roll out. Uh, you might expect flowers to be thrown down as you step out of your limousine. You, 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 you expect the trumpets to blare and the, and the traffic to stop and the people to take off their hats and folk to bow down. I mean, you expect all of these things when you think you're special. And if you had a taste of celebrity that you actually earned, you'll get a certain mindset that goes along with it. says, I am somebody, and because I'm somebody, you're supposed to treat me like I'm somebody. And you're supposed to be beneath me because I'm somebody bigger than you. Well, now I'm going to wake up call because the preacher didn't come out. The preacher sent his message. Say, hey, I got some instructions for you, G. <laughs> I need you to go over there to that river. You know, the joy. I need you to go over there to that river. And I need you to wash yourself seven times. And then the messenger went back in. <laughs> now, Naomi got mad. How many times do you get mad? When you get some instructions that you don't want to hear, to fix the condition that you didn't cause, but you are needed to fix it. Your doctor tell you, stop smoking. Your doctor tell you, push back from the table. Your doctor tell you, stop bending your elbow with that clear glass with the little beverage in it. Right? Your doctor 
God can tell you not to look at certain things, to listen to certain things. The preacher tells you. Your spouse tells you. Your children. I mean, there's a, a, an almost infinite list of individuals who are telling you not to do certain things in order to get yourself better. And you got to unmitigate it or be mad with them. You say, well, I didn't know who was mad because in verse 11 it says, but the Alma became angry and went away saying, and this is the Alma's privilege kicking in, it says, I thought, and I'm reading out the NRSB now, it says, I thought that for me, he would surely come out and stand and call the name of the Lord his God and was waving his hand over the spot of pure deliverance. Now, I'm going to make want to get off his chair. He didn't want to come down from his esteemed position to get what he needed to get. In order for God to bless you, sometimes he has to bring you down. He has to change your position. He has to humble you in order to bless you. And sometimes it just don't make sense. Right? Now, God could have sent Elisha out. And Elisha could have waved his hand. After all, Elisha had done other miracles, right? If you go back and you look in, in, in chapter 4 of 2 Kings, Elisha had basically healed a pot of stew that had been cooked with things, a stew that had been prepared with things that were not normally for human consumption. Yet, through God's power, Elisha threw some flour in the pot and told the folk to eat, and they did, and nothing befell them. So we know that God's power works through the preacher, right? We know it works through the preacher. But Naaman thought because of his position that he didn't have to do anything. How many of us think we don't have to do anything when we need something from God? That we can just stay in the same position we're in and that God will just do it for us because of who we are. Wait a minute. God don't need nothing from us but he needs us. We need everything from, from him. So why wouldn't we wait anyway? Right? But here's the other thing. Here's the other thing about now, right? You go to where you need to get some help. You're told where to get your help. And then you have the nerve to denigrate the very place that you're going to get your help from. You're hungry. You don't have anything to eat. Somebody offer you a sandwich. And you talk about you don't want it because it's not a steak. <laughs> you are somebody's special kind of fool. Because God has what you need. And you ought to be smart enough. You ought to be humble enough to do whatever it takes to get the blessing that you need so that you can go on. Right? Jeremiah 29 11 tells us about God having plans for us and to prosper us, right? He wants to see us come to a good end, but we can't do that if we remain in the position that we are in. If we stay in our exalted position, we're just not going to get there. We're just not going to get there. See, the honest problem was he was used to giving orders and commands and ears and not the other way around. It was an unfamiliar position for him. In verse 11, it tells us that it caused Naaman to be quite angry, right? Naaman thought that because of who he was and what he was, that the preacher would meet him where he was versus where he needed to go, right? How many times do we expect God to meet us in our need, in our way, instead of in God's way? When we don't receive, when we don't receive it the way we want to receive, then we get mad with God. Does Naomi's response to the instructions sent by the preacher for your benefit remind you of your former even present self? We should be reminded also 
by those who are subordinate to us that when we've been commanded to do something different, that we should submit to the task, right? When we've been asked to do something different, something difficult, we jump to that. Yet, when it's time to do the simple and the easy, and it comes from somebody who we perceive to be beneath us, we have a problem with that. Or, if we think that we're on the same level as that person, we have a problem. See, that was part of the honest problem, too. He thought he was on the same level as preacher. Because he said, because it was me, he would just come out and wave his hand. No, 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 no. It doesn't work that way. So what did they all do? Well, they questioned the methods of the prophet. We don't get what we want. We think everybody else wants, so we start to ask questions. We try to undermine, right? Because we didn't get what we wanted to get. We didn't get it the way that we wanted to get it. Therefore, they got to be wrong. We have to be right. That's not the case in this particular circumstance. And that's the wrong attitude to have, especially when you need something from God. You need to humble yourself. Right? There is a reason that you see throughout Scripture, right? In the most difficult of times, you will read about people prostrating themselves before God. They are taking a physical position of humility in order to show that they are beneath the one and true God. Right? So, so. The anger, the disproportionate response, the I didn't get it my way attitude will cause you to miss out on your blessing. It'll cause you to miss out on your healing. It'll cause you to miss out on your restoration. It'll cause you to continue in the circle of retaliation and recrimination, right? It'll cause you to continue to spin and swirl down the proverbial drain of life because you couldn't steal yourself long enough to humble yourself sufficiently yeah. to get what you were going to need in order to raise yourself up out of the situation that you were in. Because they always in a tough situation. Right? It didn't make sense for a man to have all of that to have a disease such as leprosy. I mean, after all, the Alvin was the general. He had access to he had access to showers and water and all of those, all of those kinds of things. Because remember, leprosy was considered a, 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 the disease of the unclean. So sometimes it just doesn't make sense, right? It just doesn't make sense. Well, eventually, eventually, Naaman gets over himself. He does what the, what the preacher instructed him to do and gets the outcome that he that he that he, that he desires, which is to be healed of his leprosy, right? And so here's what we learn. Here's what we learn out of this story. Several things. We learn that God has sovereignty over all nations and over all people and over all of his creation. And just because the honor was not of the house of Israel doesn't mean that God wasn't concerned about his condition and his situation. Right? The children of Israel had God, but God also made himself available to the Gentiles. Amen? And so as a result of this, everybody has an opportunity to get to heaven if they so choose, right? And so God, God's, God's sovereignty over all of his creation and that, uh, that his love and his care and concern goes beyond geographic boundaries that he cares for all of us. See, as I said, the album was a Syria, but it didn't stop God from caring about him and his condition. God's grace is for everybody, it's for the Jew and the Gentile. He cared, God cared enough to place the slave girl in the album's path for a future time. You don't know who God has captured, put under somebody else's care for your blessing at a time in the future. Right? And that whoever God has captured might not be on your level. They may be subordinate to you, both in life, right? Economic standing, social standing, age, wisdom, and knowledge. But God can use anybody to bless his people, right? See, we don't know who is going to be captured for us, but we do know that God's word in Jeremiah 29 11 tells us that God has plans to prosper us and to bring us to a good end. Faith and obedience must have a, must have a place in the life of every follower of Christ. 
Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. Yeah. Now, Alma's initial reaction was driven by his pride, not by obedience. But his healing came as a result of doing what he was commanded to do by God's representative in the person of Elijah. What does that mean? If the preacher tells you to do it, and the preacher's called of God, do it. It's for your benefit, not theirs. Amen? Amen. God used a river, perceived to be inferior to the rivers of the whole country of Syria. God used something that didn't make sense to bring about the blessing and the healing that Naaman saw, that Naaman needed. Because he asked the question, says, aren't the Abana and the far, far better rivers than the Jordan? Right? There are some accounts that I read about the River Jordan that are on par with the River Sion in France. Oh, yes, they dumped all manner of things in the Jordan River. Right? Now, Naaman may or may not have known about that part. But because he was a Syrian, he was proud of his country. He said, hey, my river's better. Can I go do this at home? Why do I have to do this in this little puny Jordan River? Right? This was Naaman's mindset. Yet, yet, even though it didn't make sense, he went and he dipped. Right? He dipped. Seven times. Right? God used something that didn't make sense. It brought a blessing. Right? The power of God's word. When God's word is obeyed, great things happen in your life. I'll say it again. When God's word is obeyed, great things happen in your life. Sometimes immediately, sometimes later on. But great things always come from God's word. God's word brings healing. When God's word goes out, it does not come back forward. Right? Humility is a path, has a path to healing. In order to get the blessing that he needed, the Alma had to humble himself to something and someone greater than himself. If you need a blessing from the Lord, you're going to have to humble yourself. If you need a blessing in the workplace, you're going to have to humble yourself. If you want a blessing in your home, you're going to have to humble yourself. If you want your children to honor you, you have to humble yourself. Yes, you can humble yourself before your children. Yes, you can. Because as parents, we don't always get it right. Right? Naaman had to submit to the authority of God's chosen messenger, especially when it just didn't make sense. We too can get a lesson out of this. If the pastor tells us to do it, we need a thing from the Lord, we'd be wise to humble ourselves. After all, in the book of Proverbs, we're told that a Holy Spirit comes before the fall. So let us not get caught being less than humble in our service to God, especially when we need everything from Him. God's ways are not our ways. Isaiah 55 and 8 says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. God can always do it better than we can. God's ways challenge our human understanding. God doesn't always show the loud fanfare. Sometimes he comes in a still, small voice. Saints of God, won't you bend your ear and quiet your spirit so that you can even hear God when he whispers. God can use anyone. He used the slave girl to play a crucial role in Naomi's healing. The point is that God uses you <coughs> and he uses me, right? <coughs> he uses us in the big things. He uses us in the small things, right? The point is that, that when God uses you and I, right, while we like to do a thing, we think that we are significant. We are legends in our own minds. But we have to be reminded we are not all that. We are all fall short. Yes. yes, yet God still uses us big and tall, short and small, and every other configuration you can think of. The slave girl was faithful to her mistress and shares helpful information that led to Naomi's transformation. Right? And then there's the acknowledgement of the one and true God. You see, when it was all said and done, and Naomi had gotten his healing, when he had gotten over himself, gotten under the water, dipped seven times, not six times, not five, not four, not three, not two, not one, but seven, the number of completion, meaning the work was done, then he got his blessing. And he declared that there is but one God, and that is the God of Israel. Brothers and, and my sisters, there are other gods with a little cheat, but none of them do and can do what our God can do, has done, is doing, and will do. 
When you encounter our God, we serve, you know that you met the true and living God. You see, the relationship between the ordinary and the extraordinary uh, is the difference between what's ordinary and mundane, right? As evidenced by they always washing himself seven times in the Jordan, right? Divine work can and does occur in ordinary circumstances. And again, it's not always loud, and it's not always the spectacle surrounding it. Human power is compared to divine power. God has divine power. They often had human power. <coughs> and human power couldn't heal. Doctors can only do so much. Money can only buy so much. Influence can only move and sway so much. But the power of God can do and accomplish all things as God so chooses to speak. We know that his word, when it goes out, doesn't come back for Humility and pride play a significant role in your life and in my life, right here on earth. I recommend that we all choose wisely, but strongly recommend that you lean heavily into humility. The reason has its place, as does faith, and faith will sustain you when reason will fail you. Sometimes it just doesn't make sense that Christ came down through 42 generations only to have only to have hung, led, and died on an old rugged cross for you and for me. It doesn't make sense that he thought enough of me and you that he would give us the gift of eternal life. It doesn't make sense that we would still be standing here in 2024 having come out of the pandemic, right? Money was funny, change was strange, and many of us still have jobs. We still have more than a portion of our health and strength. We haven't always been all that God intends for us to be. Sometimes it just doesn't make sense. But we have a God who specializes in the impossible, right? And deals with the improbable, right? It was, if, 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 if you all knew me back, There are many of you who would have said that it was improbable that I would be standing behind <laughs> this lecture. And sometimes it doesn't make sense. It didn't make sense to me that I couldn't get the interview for the job. But God knows what he's done. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And because my faith is where, where it is, and because God is where he is, yeah. and because I can submit myself to his will, because he can see things that I cannot. Yeah. And even when it doesn't make sense, I know it's going to make all the sense in the world yes. when God finally reveals to me what his plan for me is in this season in my life. Sometimes it just don't yeah. make sense. But thanks be to God.
Glory with the choices of only God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. 